Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Weird Tales Illustrated number one. Unfortunately, this is the regular edition. They, uh, at the same time, published a Fancy Pants edition. Uh, I think it had a different name than that. And it had an additional story. Kind of want to check that out, just because it's written by Les Daniels, the great comic book historian. And it's drawn by Tim Vigil of Faust fame. I just knew that from looking at Grand Comic Database. But this issue's pretty damn nice. And, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if Les Daniels can write a comic story. He just writes really good history books about comics. But uh, I'm never going to find that. I'm never going to spend the time to look for that. So I'm perfectly happy to have this edition, even though it's not like the deluxe special edition. Um, start off with a beautiful John Bolton cover. This is just beautiful stuff. Painted art. Um, we've talked about John Bolton many times on the channel for all of his work on Epic Illustrated. And uh, this is par for the course for him. Just really nice art. God, these fingers are creepy as hell. <laughs> this is published by Millennium Comics. They were pretty big in the late 80s, early 90s. I think this is uh, 1992 this was published. We got a contents page. We got a little uh, article from, I assume, the editor talking about uh, the legacy of Weird Tales, the old pulp. These guys licensed just the name. Well, actually, they even even the classic logo. And uh, and some of these stories were actually adapted from Weird Tales authors. But the first story is adapted from Harlan Ellison, famous science fiction writer. It's adapted by Faye Perazic. Uh, she wrote a bunch of stuff in the late 80s and then kind of dropped out of comics. Art by Kelly Jones. And this is kind of, I assume, kind of early for him because it's not quite up to what we think of as Kelly Jones. Because pretty much by the mid-90s, Kelly Jones was just pretty flawless. <laughs> Every panel was beautiful. There's some bum panels in this, I gotta say. We'll see. So this is the Harlan Ellison story, Shattered Like a Glass Goblin, one of his most famous stories. Pretty weird story, and it does fit in with Weird Tales, because the whole thing of Weird Tales was that it was the first time where people brought horror up to, like, modern times. For so long, horror was always associated with olden time stuff. Like, oh, it takes place in 1820s in a castle. You know what I mean? All the horror stuff took place. But Weird Tales, you know, H.P. Lovecraft, it was recognizable. It was the present. And it made it even more scary. Because it's like, oh, this is these horrible things didn't just happen 100 years ago. They're happening now. And this is very of its time because this is very, like, hippie era. I believe it's 68 and it's Los Angeles. We see this guy here, Rudy, and he's approaching this house and he's, he's afraid of it. He can sense there's something wrong with this house, but he has to go inside because Christina is there. And we'll find out soon who Christina is. This crazy gaunt eyed hippie chick opens the door and doesn't even say anything. She's pretty creepy. Some of these panels are great Kelly Jones work. And then some are just like, like, look at this. It's like, eh, not very good. I think this is the basically the time, because Kelly Jones was drawing for Marvel for years before he became the Kelly Jones that we knew. It uh, You wouldn't even recognize his Micronaut stuff back in the mid-80s. So this guy uh, has been in the army for a while. Just got medically discharged. So he's back here to find... Uh... Wait, Katrina, did I say? Sorry. <laughs> Christina. And he finds Christina. And she's like crouching down in a weird nightgown, all tattered, with a little rabbit. And she says, go away, Rudy. And he hears the sudden sound of leather wings beating furiously for a second, then nothing. He's stepping on the rabbit, the little toy rabbit, and she's like, you're crushing the rabbit. He hears the sound of someone counting heavy gold pieces. He says he's, he's returned so they could get married. 
And she says, get out of here, you moron. <laughs> so he walks through the house. He sees all these crazy hippies and some of them are freaking out from drugs. This guy's a total square, Rudy. He he's never even tried marijuana, so he's just... And the smell of the marijuana that reeks through the house, he's just like, ugh. This woman offers to sleep with him. Takes off her clothes even, he's just like, way down. So he did, uh, he knew one guy there. He was the one who took Christina to this house. So the cops come to the door and he pretty much just lies and says, oh no, there's no crazy partying here. My mother's dying of cancer. It's really quiet here. So he's hanging out with Christina and she gives him a acid and they make love. So I think she just didn't like him because he's such a square, but he takes acid and now she wants to sleep with him. And then after that experience, he seldom went out. Because he was basically the only one who ever left the house. He'd, he'd get groceries and stuff. And all these crazy sounds around him become more frequent. I really like the way, uh, I mean, I don't know how faithful this is to Harlan Nelson's story. But let's assume it is. Um, just, just that, it's got that weird Tales Lovecraft thing. It's such a slow build. Just hearing a weird sound, like the, the bat wings or the gold coins. And then, you know, you don't hear it again for a while. And you don't find out what it is. Just something's off. Something's disturbing. He goes down to the basement, which is flooded. And I don't know what we're seeing here. What are the hippies? He's got this, like, wound in his chest. And he reaches in the water and grabs this just alien-looking fish. And puts it in the wound. I think the fish is biting it. And he's like, looks like he's filled with ecstasy. Like maybe it's some kind of a soporific thing or it's like taking drugs. And now things get worse really quick. He goes upstairs and he sees these two hippie chicks eating this third one, just devouring her. Look at that gore. That's pretty nasty. And then he finally sees what's making that bat wing sound. <laughs> And his friend is now just a head with wings. He's got a cat in his mouth. And then he saw the, finds the thing that sounds like counting heavy gold pieces. Which I guess I can't wrap myself around that audio image. <laughs> if that's what you want to call it. Like, how could this creature sound like gold coins? But look at this horrific thing. <laughs> that is just a true nightmare vision. That's pretty horrifying. And then he goes upstairs and Christina is a werewolf now. She's eating human flesh as well. He says, we have to go away. But then he realizes like, no, she she wants to kill him. Not only does she not want to go away with him, but she starts chasing him. And he looks in the mirror and all of a sudden he sees himself and he's like a glass, he's a glass goblin. He looks like a goblin who's made of glass. There's nothing inside of him. Then he heard the growling behind him and Christina shatters him. The great hairy paw slapped him into a million corsicating rainbow fragments, all expanding consciously into the tight little enclosed universe that was the house on the hill. Weird little story, but I, I kind of like it. I like the, it is very like old weird tales, pulp writing, but uh, brought up to date at least Circa 1968. This next story is an original story by Faye Perazic, uh, the, the one who adapted the last story. And it's beautiful art by John Bolton. It's called Party Games. This woman is looking at this bottle. She doesn't know if it's poison, if it contains death. She doesn't know if it contains insanity or it could contain enlightenment. She doesn't know, but she drinks it anyway. 
kind of a weird, look at all this, uh, just nothing. Just a few illustrations with a few uh, little passages of uh, some captions. So all of a sudden she starts puking up her guts. Just bile coming out of her. Even tissue, little bits of tissue fell on her toes. So she's like, oh shit, I guess I killed myself, I'm dying. But then as soon as she's empty, she feels empty. She realizes she's been cleansed. And she says, hey, look at that smile on her face. As the hollow space inside of her began to glow, she realized that she understood everything. So it looks like she's got enlightenment. And she starts dancing around in joy, <laughs> dancing in her own entrails, squishing the blood and tissue between her toes. And she danced. And the last page we see wish, what's really going on. That was all in her head. And I mean, it is pretty insane what she, what she was thinking. So now we realize she's just some sad mental patient in her padded room. This is nice, a one page, uh, well, not an adaptation, just Pete Craig Russell does a beautiful illustration for the poem Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, God. What can you say about Pete Craig Russell that hasn't been said before? Beautiful colors. I'm sure he colored this himself because he's such a good colorist. That's great stuff. So this last story is called uh, Visitor from Egypt. And this is a very cryptic story. I'm not quite sure what happens in the story. But uh, we see a, there's a New England museum. And uh, this guy shows up. He's got like a scarf around his face and kind of all covered up. We find out he's Sir Richard, collector of Egyptian antiquities. And this guy knows him. He says, you must forgive me for the muffler. I had, I had an accident. Cut himself rather badly. So he's asking about the pre-dynastic rem dynastic remains fr from Luxor that are on exhibition. And he says, are the bones tinted? And he says, I should say so, Sir Richard. And I get, maybe this was something Egyptians did. They would paint the bones beautifully with these beautiful, colorful designs. And it's almost like they get into a debate about Osiris and the Book of the Dead. He says that painting the mummies, he's basically laughing at the Egyptian belief. He's amused that he he th thinks that they've, well, I'm sorry, the Egyptians thought by painting their mummies, they could restore the circulation of the blood. But Osiris is the only one who could restore the dead. He would claim that in the Book of the Dead. And uh, this guy, Sir Richard, claims that the Book of the Dead is a forgery. Nobody can bring back the dead, not even Osiris. It's almost presumptuous for humans to think that he can. This guy goes to the lavatory to get some water. I don't know why he doesn't, there's not a sink there. And all of a sudden this fire breaks out in the basement. These two security guys kind of from the museum go downstairs to the basement with a fire extinguisher. It's pretty well drawn right there. Most of this is kind of like, you know, they're not quite there. I'll tell you the artists at the end, the credit box is at the end and I want to flip forward. So these two guys are downstairs with fire extinguisher and this guy comes out of the dark, the scary looking monster and kills them. And I guess it's Sir Richard. And he sees Sir Richard from behind rifling through this uh, 
museum case, taking some stuff, some of these Egyptian artifacts. And this guy's so scary. He's grabbing all those bones, those painted bones, that uh, the the museum curator, Busby, he just loses his mind. <laughs> he just, it's, his mind snaps. It's so horrifying. It does look pretty scary. And then the creature breathes on him three times, breathes on his face three times. And when the coroner arrives, he concludes that the curator, Busby, had been dead for a long, long time. So it's like he sucked the life out of him, kind of. I know it's a very odd story. So, so this is a an adaptation of a story by a. Well, I guess I have to go to the context please. Sorry, Frank Bell Belknap Long. He uh, wrote for uh, Weird Tales. He was kind of an acolyte of H.P. Lovecraft. It was adapted by Paul Davis, art by Eddie Newell, and Mark Menendez. Eddie Newell did a lot of stuff for like Now Comics and Millennium. He was always like popping up in all these weird little independent comic companies. And uh, I guess it was serviceable art. I never saw anything that great from him. But that's it, guys. Weird Tales Illustrated number one, regular edition. And, uh, you know, it's not the best comic you've ever read, but it's not bad. And it's got that, it, just for that P. Craig Russell page alone, <laughs> I want to keep this. It's beautiful. And that John Bolton art, I kind of like that story. But, and also the Harlan Nelson story is pretty interesting. But uh, it's almost like if this was made a few years later, that Kelly Jones art would have been perfect and uh, impeccable. So it's kind of a shame because it's getting Kelly Jones in a, almost his chrysalis before he had fully blossomed into the mature artist that we know as Kelly Jones today. So I hope you liked it, guys. And uh, hopefully I'll see you next time here at the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies.